Hello and most welcome to 1733 of the Heidegger series. We will today continue where we left off in 1728 with the article of Daniel D. Hutto, Hutto, Wittgenstein and Psychology, liberating our minds. And we are currently at page 10. We've been discussing how the turn to scientism for a technological assessment of psychological problems leads to confusion and mumbling up of things destruction of meaning and uh, lack of understanding. What we will see is that there is no complaints or criticism of Newton. As long as the Newtonian concepts are used in a proper context and explanation which is used in technology are within technology and physics. Transferred to psychology and other areas we begin to confound important ideas. Psychological concepts are a well-established language game with millennia and millennia behind it itself. It is actually nothing like the language game newly constructed for Newtonian physics. Transferring the Newtonian language game to emotions or other aspects of our, uh, our, our life world will lead, to, will lead to serious confusion. The problem lies in confounding two absolutely different life worlds and scientifically, which is the often used term for this confusion, applying mechanistic language to a completely different family of uh, language games. Yes, there are likeness between psychology and physics, but those likenesses are of family quality. That means that they are not same they are taking place or are being in similar positions, which does not imply sameness and applicability to same treatment. Psychology needs to needs descriptions, not explanations to work. It doesn't make sense to explain an emotion at all. That is the most important difference.
There is a site at page 10. Consider that the Papineau tries to persuade us that philosophy is like science. <laughs> in that it is primarily aimed at understanding the actual world studied by science, not some further realm or metaphysical modality. I think that is rather typical of the reasoning and I say to a certain extent it makes absolute sense to go through those changes or acts there is not an inkling of doubt in doing this seems absolutely apt and consistent with the thinking just to transfer and use the same method I have further mentioned in a previous lecture that I call this technological thinking could be slightly misleading however but it is apt because it comes from technology and as long as it is used within technology it will serve its absolute purpose without any problem at all We have further suggestions when we go further down in the page. Williamson, 2007, maintains that philosophy's interest in discovering new facts about various phenomena and, as such, philosophical truths are not generally truths about words or concepts. And while he agrees that at least some branches of philosophy are scientific, he allows the philosophical investigations can perfectly well concern the a priori, the analytic, and the possible. This is because although he sees philosophy and science as aligned, he refuses to endorse the Philistine emphasis on a few natural sciences. In essence, the mainstream actively embraces a particular self-conception of its central business, that of advancing theoretical explanations in ways that help to promote exactly the sort of deeply ingrained 
and hard to escape trends of thought about so-called mental phenomena that Wittgenstein warns again against. Given the diametrically opposed starting points, it is hardly surprising that contemporary analytical philosophers, let alone empirically minded psychologists, are dismissive of uh, Wittgenstein's proposed focus and methodology. Today, as Horich observes, the name Wittgenstein is uttered with a curl of the lip in many philosophical circles. Given the scientific turn in philosophy, which regards philosophy to be continuous with science, it's easy to why this might be so. Reflecting on the state of uh, Oxford philosophy in a recent interview, David Chalmers describes his desire to move away from the a priori approach it embraced in his aspiration to make connection with science. In announcing his interest in understanding consciousness, in this mood to his fellow graduate students, most of which were Wittgensteinians, he reports that one of them said I should study how the word conscious is used in our language games. That set the tone for the place for me, perhaps wrongly. exhibiting the same attitude in referring to Wittgenstein's idea of a form of life. Fodor and Lepore simply note, we don't know what to make of this. Anyhow, we're pretty sure it's not the way we wish to make philosophy. The fundamental disagreement about the target and nature of the philosophical enterprise explains why, despite the fact that Wittgenstein unquestionably occupies an extremely prominent place in the canon of Western philosophy,
His approach is generally reviled, and his insights on method and their implications for the possibilities of philosophy are typically misrepresented, downplayed or ignored in the contemporary analytical scene. Indeed, the prevailing view amongst those who dismiss Wittgenstein today is that the main one of them, the main one of the many things that were drawn with the philosophy of mind in the Wittgenstein right tradition was its inability even to make sense of such notions as that of mental process. The constituents of mental processes are causal interactions among the very sorts of things whose existence Wittgenstein, Reil and their followers are committed to denying. The dominant trend in analytic philosophy is to, is to suppose that all good philosophizing must take the form of theorizing that aims to discover something new about the phenomenon under investigation. In this respect, theoretical philosophy must self-consciously and directly oppose the approach recommended by Wittgenstein. Speaking for the mainstream, Forder supplies the following remark in which he disparages Wittgenstein's reasons for rejecting philosophical theorizing in the domain of psychology. It epometizes the deep disagreement of a philosophical target and method between those who follow Wittgenstein and their detractors. I would have thought that explaining the empirical data by postulating processes whose nature is left for later investigation is characteristic of rational theory construction.
isn't that exactly what Newton did about gravity? Is it psychology that Wittgenstein doesn't like or is it science as such? This way of putting things can make it appear that Wittgenstein's approach is at bottom anti-scientific. Yet notably when Wittgenstein assesses that the state of psychology and calls it barren. He worries that it embeds a mix of methods and conceptual confusion. The existence of experimental method makes us think we have a means of solving the problems which troubles us, though the problems and the method pass each other by. Importantly, is not, it is not the experimental methods with which he finds fault. Rather, Wittgenstein's interest is in how psychologists characterize and understand their data, not how they come by it per se. Wittgenstein's interests in and concerns about psychology arises arise precisely because far from achieving the status of purely empirical science by his lights psychology is ridded with conceptual confusions of a philosophical nature Consider that science is full of so-called expanded meanings. Instances in which a familiar word such as charm or spin is used with an entirely new sense in a scientific theory and thereby given special technical meanings.
In such cases as Horridge emphasizes, we must be aware that the meaning of a word is something we bestow, not usually explicitly, by means of deliberate stipulation, but often implicitly, merely by using the word in certain way so that the change in its meaning does not require an overt for definition, but may come about through a shift in its fundamental pattern of deployment. So, bearing confusion over the labels, we should not, for example, come to be mystified about the metaphys metaphysical status of so-called imaginary points in mathematics once we know how such terms are used. This works fine for pure cases in which new terms are introduced into science. But the trouble is that in psychology, psychology there is often no such clean break between ordinary and scientific usages. A prime example of an impure case can be found in what Wittgenstein calls Freud's abonimal, abonimal mess Wittgenstein famously takes issue with psychoanalysis and the sort of myth mythologies of the mind it promotes. The root problem is that it confuses reasons, for example, a patient's expressed narrative about their dreams with empirically discovered causes. So the dream and the explanation of the dream are not related in germ and uh, explicit. This led its practitioners to lay claim to have explained things in psychodynamic terms when they had only in fact elected certain descriptions from their patients. Hence, Wittgenstein accused Freud of everywhere confounding hypothesis with 
further descriptions. Treating his findings as if they were a matter of scientific discovery. Freud advances explanations when the matter he deals with demand clarification. That is, they call for elucidation of the relation in which we stand to the phenomena rather than an explanation of them. Indeed, the situation is made worse by the fact that on Wittgenstein's analysis, the phenomena dealt with are beyond empirical explanation and that understanding them does not require them, require it. So we try to mold something that doesn't fit at all into technical explanations. Freud theorizing provides a pretty clear and compelling case in which the explanations on offer are not scientific, they are scientistic. To the extent that today's sciences of the mind also embed impure picture-sponsored scientific thinking, there remains an urgent and inescapable need for conceptual clarification with respect to how they conceive of its subject matter. Seen in this context, Butcher Fodor, it should be clear that Wittgenstein's recommended approach to psychology is neither motivated by a particular dislike of it nor a general dislike of science. Rather, Wittgenstein recommended his approach because by his lights such an approach is needed for philosophical reasons. It is need to deal with the conceptual confusions that are if he's right, as right in what builds itself as a scientific psychology as they are in professional philosophy. Put the record straight, it was never unpolluted, psychological, 
theorizing per se, such as the scientific contributions of Newton that concerned Wittgenstein. So while Wittgenstein is not opposed to science, he is, a, he is opposed to the idea that philosophy could be prosecuted in a scientific manner, namely that philosophical problems can be resolved by making new scientific discoveries about the operations of mind, of the mind. Thus, in speaking of psychologies, conceptual confusions, Wittgenstein is taking those to be of a distinctively philosophical kind, namely as having a source and character that makes it impossible to overcome them by the provision of a better or more refined theories, explanations, or empirical studies. Apparently, as Freud's case exemplifies, scientists have no natural immunity to picture-driven intellectual diseases. And to the extent that they do suffer from such diseases, the only possible treatment for their condition is philosophical treatment. Aren't the contemporary sciences of the mind in better shape today? There's reason to think not. Consider a shining example that is brought to light by Forder's claim that Hume is the true grandfather of cognitive sciences. And moreover, bearing some inessential differences that his theory of ideas is really a form of Cartesian theory of mind. Viewed from a sufficiently general vantage point, Fodor identifies the main commitment of Hume's theory of ideas as being essentially Cartesian in that both regard concepts to be a species of mental representations and are distinguished 
by what they mentally represent. The concept C is simply whatever it is with which the mind represents in thought the property of being seen, or better, since conceptual representations are intentional, it's whatever it is with which the mind represents in thought the property of being seen as such. Over time, the central branches of cognitive science have moved away from thinking of mental processes in human associationist terms in favor of understanding them computationally. Moreover, the empiricist notions of that idea resemble what they stand for has been mostly replaced been mostly replaced as well. Even so, Fodor is right to that the general idea that mental processes are defined as operations over inner mental objects of some sort is still very much alive and well at the foundations of today's sciences of the mind. To the extent that this is so, contemporary scientific psychology inherits a cornerstone assumption from Hume's theory of ideas and long tradition in philosophy. that it is committed to a picture according to which concepts are literally mental objects. What is the source of this assumption? Fisher argues that the concept of mind and idea first may debut in the West along with the rise of British empiricism during the early uh, modern period. From the mid 17th to the mid 18th century in tune with Fyodor's assessment of the situation. It is at this point that a concept, a new concept of mind as a kind of container of mental happenings were first forged, displacing the previously dominant Aristotelian conception of mind.
on Fisher's analysis, the new notion of mind, which was built on an analogy between perceiving and thinking, had two aspects. It implied a perceptual space in which objects of perception are located and a perceptual organ with which they are viewed. Accordingly, on this new way of thinking about minds, perception only occurs when some sort of idea is in the mind. Once the perceiving thinking analogy was firmly in place, these characteristic frameworks ideas came to be treated as obviously true by philosophers at the time. And yet, as Fisher emphasizes, they are clearly not part of common sense. Instead, they are distinctively philosophical and at the time, fresh intuitions shared without explicit argument by many early modern thinkers. So this goes to show that this thinking is now so firmly established in all branches of intellectuality, knowing and understanding that we have no concept that it is even there. Technolo technological thinking is not something you can discover easily. The therapeutical method of Wittgenstein makes it possible for the first time, I'd say. Without his help, it strictly is out of bounds not something that really can happen. So no, mot no matter what subject matter you are studying at high school or university, it will be firmly embedded and you will bring it all ready as it is to the study hall. It is there. You will seek explanations in a rather newly invented language of Newtonian classical physics. And as Fisher said, could have started already a hundred years earlier because of the technological uh, breakthroughs that were already made during the late Renaissance, early Baroque. So these things are, I would say, strictly impossible to discover by oneself. So you can imagine the gratitude I feel towards Wittgenstein for this. I think it's an apt time to end here. Uh, thank you for listening in. Have a very pleasant uh, morning, day, afternoon, or wherever you are. Bye-bye.